Today, the Criterium de Dauphiné is just another one-week-long world tour race on the cycling calendar, with the exception of it having the scenery of the Tour de France and the glamour that ASO injects into its favourite races. But with a mediocre level of participator, in which only a very few of the candidates for the Grand Boucle appear in the race. However, some 20 years ago, it was the great test bed for the Tour, where the riders prepared with the best medication in the world on the toughest roads on the planet. The edition where we saw the most fireworks was the hilarious 2004 Dauphiné, where after a hesitant 2003 Tour de France, it looked like Lance Armstrong was going into decline and would never win again in Paris. However, a month and a half later, Lance once again raised his arms on the Champs-Élysées. Do you want to know how that triumph was forged? Without further ado, let the show begin. Lance Armstrong faced the 2004 season with some doubts. That year, which saw the start of legal proceedings against him, because of suspicions about his crushing victories in the Tour de France, he had only one stage win in the victory column. At the Tour de Georgia, against the likes of César Augusto Grajales, Scott Moninger, and the legendary McRib fantastic Christopher Horner. That was more than just a competition, a bath of masses in honour and grace of the US postal rider, who had not yet faced any major rivals that season before the Criterium de Dauphiné. In addition to the problems he had in the 2003 Tour de France, in which had it not been for a crash by Jan Ulrich in the last time trial in Nantes, the result could have been tremendously close. Fortunately for Lance, the German was no longer a problem for him in 2004, as he had returned to telecom, and with it, its diet of beer and greasy foods, that made him a paid megalodon on the bike. But in that Dauphiné, more rivals would appear. Of them all, the one Armstrong was most worried about was undoubtedly his former teammate, Tyler Hamilton, who the year before had put in some remarkable displays in the Tor Mountains, with a broken collarbone, and perfectly good blood bags that had given him miraculous climbing abilities, even more so than in his US postal years. LA had Hamilton perfectly under control, a man who was far from being an alpha male like the Texan, and with a weaker mentality, and certainly less of a bully than the then four-time Tour de France winner. But he didn't have such a grip on the dangerous Fonac team for which he had signed that season. A Swiss licensed outfit, but de facto controlled by the Spanish doctor, Efemiana Fuentes, who had several of his VIP clients, like the buffalo Jose Enrique Gutierrez, the guy who had mistaken his blood bag for one of those of Santiago Perez, and the ever young Oscar Sevilla in his ranks. No doubt, Fuentes was a worthy rival to Michele Ferrari, and those potential medical advantages baffled Cheryl Crow's then boyfriend. Another equally dangerous rival was Spanish climber Iban Mayo, who unlike the Fonax had a team willing to work 100% for him. He had finished second in the Liège-Baston-Liège, just behind Tyler Hamilton in 2003, and was especially scary after his magnificent Tour de France, where although he finished 6th overall due to his poor time trial skills, he had been the best climber, winning on Alpe d'Huez and attacking in many of the high mountain stages. Muscatel's preparation at the hands of Dr. Jesus Losa was absolutely enviable, and on a par with those of Uffe Fuentes which, coupled with Mayo's Marco Pantani-like character in racing, alarmed Armstrong greatly. And in part, he was right to be alarmed. Already in the first stage, a short time trial in Magev, Mayo and Hamilton took the first two places in a surprising manner, especially if we look at the five Fonac riders amongst the first eight classified that day. In the third stage of San Etienne, it was Buffalo Gutierrez who took the win and a lead in one of his classic exhibitions, attacking in the last metres, something that puzzled Lance who saw that neither Floyd Landis nor Jose Azevedo were up to the level of the Gregarios of the other teams. Everything will be defined in the time trial to Mont Ventoux, the day in which EPO, blood bags 
and syringes gave us one of the most brilliant cycling spectacles of the 21st century. It was possibly Lance Armstrong's biggest defeat in a prestigious competition since 1999. On a scorching hot day, the US postal rider looked tired and overmatched on the tough climb up the bald mountain of Provence. So much so that he lost a whopping two minutes to the stage winner. No more and no less than Iban Mayo, who, with his cap backwards and his agile pedalling where there's no vegetation, flew almost one kilometre per hour faster than Armstrong and took an undisputed victory. A fully fledged exhibition in which only Tugboat could be considered to be in the same league. The American of Phonak arrived 35 seconds behind the Spaniard and with a face full of sweat from the effort, he had not won but had distance his biggest rival for the tour by almost one minute and a half. In addition, his teammate Oscar Sevilla had finished third and Buffalo Gutierrez seventh so he knew perfectly well that Ufe's stealth preparation had been on the right track. This fact infuriated Lance Armstrong, who could not believe what he had seen. Defeated and humiliated, he decided to take action, although it would not be in that Dauphiné. In the two stages that ended the competition, and which were the only televised ones, we saw two other displays of doping for history. In the sixth stage, with as much as eight climbs, we saw one of the first rides of Chicken Rasmussen, always dressed up in his Rabobank jersey and white and skinny legs, taking the victory with more than six minutes over the peloton of favourites led by El Buffalo. The next day, the then cofferless rider and self-confessed doper, Stewie O'Grady, showed incredible climbing skills on the Col du Sarsenas and took the win in another stage that was given away by Iban Miles Wuskital team who were content to see their leader take the yellow jersey as champion of that epic drug-filled Dauphiné. However, Armstrong that day sprinted as if he was fighting for the stage win, to make it clear that the Von Toe defeat would be his last. Low-cost Lance contacted his friend at the UCI, Hein Verbruggen, and in Tyler Hamilton's own words, began making calls to literally turn off the tap of blood bags to Wiscatel and Fonak. A day before the start of the Tour de France, Armstrong's friend, David Miller, peddled more in the dark than ever and confessed that the Uscatel doctor, Jesus Lossa, was providing him with EPO so he could fly in the mountains as he did in the 2003 Dauphiné. In the third stage, flat and with pave, Mayo was left without any strength. With the rest of the Uscatel team, losing more than four minutes to Lance Armstrong, he abandoned before the mountains, and so he could not shine in the Pyrenees. The official excuse was that he had caught a virus. The virus have not been able to have the best EPO on the market, in reality. More creepy was what happened to Tyler Hamilton. The Yankee was less than one minute behind Armstrong before the first mountain stages, but as soon as he reached the Pyrenees, on the stage to La Mangie, he started losing time along with some of his other Phonak teammates. He was not shining as expected and lost more than three minutes and any chance of beating Armstrong in that tour. But worse was what happened to him the next day on the road to Plateau de Bay. While Armstrong was in the lead with his pre barilla friend Iban Basso, Tyler Hamilton was left on the first hard ramps with an unnatural pallor on his face. The ambulance showed up to take away Tugboat, who as he himself declared, had ingested a bag of bad blood that had cost him almost 50,000 euro and that made him urinate black that day. As he himself said, almost 20 years later, his performance in Mont Ventoux caused Armstrong to pull enough strings with the UCI to put him out of the game. Without a doubt, being a cyclist in the 2000s, was the healthiest profession in the world.